moment of silent prayer and then we'll we'll get started. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the second uh, session. Thank you for uh, everything you provide us. We just ask for um, concentration and also understanding of your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ and ask in his name. Amen. So, um, I think last couple classes I was in Romans and uh, we were kind of making our way through that because it talks about justification, which is uh, basically synonymous with salvation. We said that justification is at the moment you accept Christ uh, through faith, uh, you receive God's righteousness, his imputed righteousness to you. That's what we call justification. So you can think of justification as salvation, but it's just that you're getting something and you're getting something that you need to live for eternity, which is part of God himself, right? It's his, uh, his righteousness. So, um, and I just wanted to start reading in the verse uh, to show you where we've been, kind of what we went through, and then we'll, I'll bring up a few points and then we'll keep going. So Romans 3.21 says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I think I emphasize that, but I also think this is a major point. Just to show that, uh, you know, there really is no distinction as far as when it comes to gaining, when it comes to persevering, all have fallen and fall short is the key. In God's mind, perfection sees everyone as fallen and unable to come out of that fallen state. That's the justice of God. That's why we're all on the same playing field. So when we try to compensate, overcompensate that fallenness with our own works, it doesn't make us distinct. The fact is we're still fallen and all fall short of the glory of God. And Paul calls it out right here. He says, for there is no distinction. So um, that's a good thing to remember. So there's no different, um, difference among us. Now, there is a difference after the point of salvation. We do know that, right? After the, some people live faithfully, some people don't live faithfully as believers. That's where the distinction comes in because now you have the ability to produce fruit in the plan of God, to produce divine good works, and that's what distinguishes you. But guess what? All that's based on God's righteousness. See, before that point, if you don't have that, you're not, there's no distinction. You've got to be distinguished by something that you're already in and already a child of God with, which is his righteousness. So we've all fallen short, and, um, but thank God that he has provided a way for us to um, be one of his children. And also to, um, I like to think of the spiritual life as a place where we can really grow and prosper and that's different from the, the physical career or the, you know, whatever career you may have wished you have had or wanted and God put you in the position you're in. See, God knows exactly where we need to be so we can grow at our maximum potential. I think that's part of it. That's part of the, the God's benefit looking out for us as believers. He's trying to show us that it's not necessarily about the physical. It's about what he's designed you to do. He knows your skill set. He knows your personality. And he also knows that you have to live the Christian way of life. So we've got to integrate those things into one. And here you are in what you're doing now. So or on the way to it. Right. God knows the steps. And then verse 24. It says being justified as a gift. There's that gift again by his grace. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now remember redemption has to do with um, paying a ransom and being freed. 
That's what the word actually means. And now I think I brought that out last time. The actual ransom is the death on the cross that Christ paid on our behalf. And that's what really frees us out of the slavery uh, that we're born into in this world, right? The slavery of sin, or you could call it eternal condemnation. That penalty still had to be paid, and it is paid now. So there's the ransom. Uh, you're not in debt anymore, you could say. Uh, well, at least before or after the point of faith, alone in Christ alone, there's always the debt available. Uh, the debt's there. But the debt has also been paid. And that's why God has to offer it to us as a gift. Because, you know, even though a gift, even though there's options, even though there's benefits, we as people can sometimes say, no, I'm good. It happens all the time. And that's why this world is God has given us that great responsibility to, to choose our, our destiny, to choose our path in life, to choose everything we do uh, and so uh, it's a big deal so and then verse 25 or sorry did I read verse 25 whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith and we talked about propitiation and that means that a quick way to say this is God's justice is satisfied in Christ that's it God's justice is satisfied in the what Christ did on the cross See, we wouldn't have satisfied Jesus Christ's justice if we would have all collectively said, let's just die for the human race and we're truly honest and faithful and we just want to we just want to pay the penalty so they don't have to go to hell. God's justice can't be satisfied in that because we're sinners. It had to be someone perfect. And that's another part of this where, you know, there's that's where we can't inject ourselves into the salvation plan all we can do is accept that but we can't inject ourselves into trying to gain it or be a part of that we just accept it and then we're in it you could say and then we're a part of it right so this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed I think that's verse 26 yep now notice these two words. Remember when we first started this study, I said the word righteousness can also be translated just or justice. Well, here's one of those examples, at least in this translation. Your translation may say, and it very could it makes sense to say this, he would be righteous and the, the one who gives righteousness to the one who has faith in Jesus. Makes more sense to me, actually, if you put righteousness in there. But you can see how the word justice here, and that works too, but the justifier is the one who is actually giving out the righteousness. Do you see that? So I just wanted to show you that here's, a, here's an adjective and a verb but they both mean righteousness and they can be translated justice as well. But we saw how those kind of those come together in Jesus Christ. And and I like how it says this was a demonstration. Uh, the, the whole plan, the picture of the cross, how it was all laid out, how the only thing we can do is accept it. It's just a demonstration of how perfect God is, his righteousness. It just shows how well thought out and how there's not one decision in that process that impugns his character as a God and our perfect God. And so it is a demonstration, a very awesome demonstration at that. And then also remember we had the, uh, I don't know if I gave you that verse, uh, the passing over of sin as well in this because of Christ's death on the cross God the Father was able to pass over our sin and what I mean by that is that penalty that was due that's the passing over see you technically get a free ticket once you've accepted that ransom 
that Christ paid on the cross, you no longer have to pay that penalty. That is the, I guess, part of the good news that you're no longer indebted to pay once you die and go to eternal, the eternal lake of fire. So that's an exciting thing. Um, and this is the message of salvation. So, so there's the solution to man's life's problem, to all of man's life's problems. It's found in Jesus Christ, which is actually offered not just to some, but to all. As you well know, some of these, uh, the Calvinist uh, type of thinking also believe in limited atonement if they're a full-fledged, um, you know, tulip, five-point Calvinist. That's the limited atonement, which means God chose. And if you're not chosen, that means salvation is, isn't, you're just not one of the chosen ones. Now, we all can logically understand that God knows who's going to be saved before they're saved. He knows the final number before we know the final number. But that's the point. We don't know. Volition is still 100% in effect for all. The Christ, uh, Christ on the, his death on the cross is provided for all. That's why it says, for Christ so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son. That whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's provided to all. So don't get mixed up in that limited atonement stuff either. Now, so we looked at this, two words here, and I, I, I like to look at it as he would be righteous and the one who gives righteousness to the one who has faith in Jesus. Makes more sense. And then right after this verse, saying that God is just and the justifier. Paul then asked the obvious question they needed to hear. I think they needed to hear it. Where then is boasting? Where is it? Where, where does boasting fit into this equation? In other words, where does your merit from what you've done fit into this? Where does the spotlight put on you fit into this, what, what Paul is just referring to? Where does it fit in? He's asking them. He's saying, where then is boasting? In other words, where is the merit that you can say you've contributed to your own salvation? Um, and, and that's kind of where all those, the persevering model fits in, doesn't it? Right here. There's always a reason to boast. And there's a reason to take credit there's a reason that's all Paul is lumping all that into this word right here. That contribution that you um, that a person can think that they have towards their own salvation. That's what Paul means. Of course, Paul answers his own question here. He says it is excluded. It's excluded. It doesn't fit. It says, by what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. You know, it, I don't know how they get around verses like this. But it's very hard to misinterpret or mistranslate or teach this in any different way besides to believe an exclusion of my works and excluding my works. The law of faith. Once again, here's faith emphasized as the only way. And I know I brought this up before, but God can only save those who are not saved. He can only save you if you're not saved. What does that mean? He can only save you if you don't have his righteousness. So you've got to be without God, not growing spiritually, not any part of the God's plan before he can save you. So where does the persevering fit in if God has to save you from ground zero? He's got to save you at point A before you can get to point B. See what I mean? So all that means is that you have, have to already have been justified in order to live the spiritual way of life. 
You have to already have God's righteousness in order to grow spiritually. So it's a big difference, a different way to think. Um, so Paul brings the same point out in Romans 4, 1 through 6. Let's look at this briefly. It says, What then shall we say that our forefathers Abraham has found according to the flesh? For if, here's, the, here's justification again. It says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So here's your two types of gospels. Here's your two types of justification. Here's your two types of teaching when it comes to this right here. Because Paul is definitely showing us that there is two types of justification. One is before God and one is before man. He's saying if Abraham was justified by his works, then he has something to boast about and he's justified not before God, but before man. Because honestly, man's only way to understand that you're holy is through your faith and your lifestyle. So you're justified between man by your works. But this is saying not before God. Do you see? See the difference there? So, and this is actually referring to salvation, but he does throw works in here just to show you that works are excluded. Works are excluded. And then verse 3 says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him, to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due, as what is due. So this whole concept of going into this and saying, I'm going to do something, look what it's doing. It's actually, it says not credited as favor, but as what is due. That's not a good thing. See what happens when you try to s circumvent the plan of God, it actually ends up biting you. Verse five, but to the one who does not work, here you go but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. You know what? Justifying the ungodly does not fit into a persevering model at all. You realize that? Their mindset is you have to be godly in order to get into heaven. You have to have a good life in order to get into the pearly gates. God justifies the ungodly. In other words, you're an unbeliever and now you're a believer. It's very logical. It all makes a very good sense. You just have to um, just see it. I think it's clear here. God justifies the ungodly. It says um, his faith is credited as righteousness. Verse six, just as David also speaks of the blessings on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So now at this point, you're either tired of hearing about works and how they're excluded or maybe you've learned and now you fully understand. And I hope maybe both of those. Maybe you're not tired of all this stuff. But this is an important point, I think, to drive home when it comes to people earning or gaining something that is unearnable and not gainable. So another way to, to look at this is God's righteousness is infinitely more valuable and pristine than anything I could ever do or gain. It's just on a different level than something that I can contribute. It's perfect. It's perfection, right? So up to this point, we've defined God's righteousness. We've talked about how we receive his righteousness at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, which is also called justification. And at the beginning of this, I mentioned the Pharisees uh, who Jesus described as, you remember this, outwardly appearing to be righteous to men, but inwardly are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's from the scripture. Remember, this is Jesus himself looking to men who look very, very holy, 
followed the Mosaic law to a T. It actually went overboard on that, right? Because they added to it, kind of like our Constitution. That's what that reminds me of. You add law after law after law after law after law, then you don't know what to do. You're like, well, what can I do? Can I do anything? Not really, because the Pharisees would get mad at you and they said you broke the law. That's what, hap that's what ended up happening. And you get into a lot of legalism and say, judging, you know, you didn't do what you were supposed to do type thing. But that's Jesus basically calling, he was calling them out. And I wanted you to see what that outwardly appearing to be, to be righteous is not necessarily indicative of being righteous. And we'll look at this in, in scripture and actually, or even of being saved. And they were poster children of this next verse. That I, this is Romans 10, 3. The Pharisees fit this model. Paul says, for being ignorant about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And you've heard this before. I covered this verse, remember? Now, I wanted to remind you that the word hypocrite here, here fits pretty good because it's people that do one thing and mean another. That's the definition. Just for the outward appearance, of course. It means an actor, a pretender, or someone who says and does one thing and thinks another. And that's really what the, the issue is. It's about thought connected to action. Are we hypocrites? Well, we learn, we study. Are we taking this outside the church? You know, a lot of people are turned off with the church because they're very hypocritical. They say one thing, they act one way, and then they do another. Happens all the time. Happens in church after church after church. And what happens is it turns people off. And in one way, I think that's a good thing. Because it would turn me off, too, from whatever church or whatever denomination. Like if these Pharisees were around, guess what? You wouldn't want to have any part of that because you could see through the hypocrisy. So it's a good thing that it's turning people off. But at the same time, I think it's meant to redirect them to something better. Because there is a place where there's a genuine faith, but it, it boils down to individual responsibility, right? We could have hypocrites in this church. We could. I don't know. Maybe I don't know who it is. Maybe I don't know your individual personal lives. I know you're here learning. But you get the point. It doesn't take much to come in here and learn to where we can see you here and then go out and do something completely different, think completely different, and not follow through with what you learned in here. So hypocrites can be anywhere. But it seems so mainstream in most churches today. We show up. We'll make you think we're going to church, and, and we are, and we're, that we're good people and we're holy, but then we think something completely different and we live in a completely different way when you don't see us. But when you see us, we're going to flip that switch back on and we're going to look holy. That was the Pharisees. So that's a good word. Hypocrites is the word, hypocrite. Kind of sounds like it a little bit. So now for the, when it comes to a hypocrite, I think we can understand that since, when it comes to the unbeliever, that since when they don't have God's righteousness, it's very understandable that they're a hypocrite. There's no way they can be thinking truth, anything related to scripture. They're just working off their own morality, doing what is so-called good, and being moral. So we can understand that they're not even a believer, so it's not rooted in God or rooted in truth. But now think about a believer. It's very, very possible to be a hypocrite as a believer in Jesus Christ. Happens all the time. Um, and that's what I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit more. What about the believer who does have God's righteousness? How can someone have God's righteousness 
and be unfruitful. Well, believe it or not, we all have fallen into that category. We all do fall into that category. We all have God's righteousness and we all have different levels of fruit that we produce as believers in Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this a little bit. This is also called carnality. This is also called um, producing dead works. I'm speaking to believers, to you now. And I want to show you this chart because I think this chart kind of clearly shows us, remember the three phases that I talked about, about what we're saved from in our life. Now, it looks busy, but it's not that bad. This is the three phases. Look at it like this. The first phase is when you were saved. Okay? That's in the past. Let's go top to bottom. It's in the past. That's the moment. A moment of time. You see the time factor on the bottom. That was a point in time you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're saved from what? The penalty of sin. That was Christ's death on the cross. That's what you were saved from. That's also called justification. We also call this positional sanctification. However you want to look at it. Those are both synonymous terms, actually. So you see uh, phase number two. This is right now. This is your Christian life. This is your walk. This is your life, spiritual growth. Now, what are you saved from? You're saved on a continual basis from the power of sin in your life. That's what we're fighting against. That's what the struggle's against. That's what we're going against the grain, against the power of sin. And the Word and the Holy Spirit gives us that power to accomplish that, right? Or to not accomplish that. That could go both ways. We call this, um, you're probably more used to hearing experiential sanctification, but some people just term this one sanctification. And this is a process, right? This is a process of time. And then number three is the future. You die. You're saved from the very presence of sin. When you're removed from this earth, you have a new body. The sin nature is no longer a part of you. Um, this is called glorification or ultimate sanctification. This is a moment in time. When you die, take your last breath. And the reason why I wanted to point this out is because there's a lot of confusion in here when it comes to uh, working or persevering. There's a merging of phase one and phase two. If you don't have phase two, you never had phase one is what they'll tell you. Or if you don't show proof of phase two, you lose phase one. In other words, you can lose your salvation. That's the, the second one I said. The first one was, if you don't show Christian growth, then you never believed in the first place. You never had true, genuine faith. That's what they'll tell you. That's their philosophy. So see how these are merging together, phase one and phase two. Now, automatically when I say this, what the opponents say to this view is, Oh, he's downplaying the Christian growth. He's saying you don't need to grow as a Christian. I didn't say that. I said it's not required for salvation. I didn't say it wasn't important at all. Matter of fact, it's what God mandates us to do once you become a believer. And it's actually what distinguishes you as a believer once you start to grow up spiritually. So I think that's the difference is they're saying it's a requirement. I think the Word of God says it's not for salvation. Is it a requirement for phase two, living the Christian way of life? Yes. And there's repercussions for not doing that as a believer. You know, God has, uh, He wants you to Him. He wants you to be all His. And part of that means living in a different way for Him, thinking in a different way for Him, and that all falls into phase two. Now, when we don't do that, what happens? Discipline. Discipline. That's what the whole sin unto death entails in the scripture. The sin unto death means there's a believer who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Maybe they were growing. Maybe they weren't. But anyways, they're not. 
at a point in time, and they continue to reject, 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 and eventually, what does God do? He says, your time's up. I'm going to take you home to heaven because you're not doing me any good down there, and you'd be a lot better off up here with me. And that's just the love of God. Letting us, not letting us cause destruction, more destruction to our own soul and ourself and others around us through rejection of Him. He, he knows best. He knows when to take us home. And you might know someone in that category who was a believer but chose wrong decision after wrong decision after wrong decision, weren't interested in learning about who God was, and came to that point in their life, uh, but that doesn't mean they, their salvation was taken from them because it wasn't a requirement for salvation. It's a requirement to distinguish yourself with rewards, with blessings, and how you live on this earth and in heaven, right? Don't forget about heaven is not equal. We're not all going to have the same things, doing the same thing, and everything's the same. That's what a certain party wants, at least to believe. But volition is what distinguishes the believer. Volition. So I think that's understandable. Um, but this is the only one that is a process. And you know who didn't live that process, right? The thief on the cross. He didn't have a chance. Uh, I don't. I know that's not the the um, poster child for a, the Christian way of life. He actually rejected Christ his entire life, didn't live any of phase two, only got to phase one. And of course, Jesus told him, "I'll see you in paradise with me. You'll be in paradise with me." Right? But that that's not telling us, oh, we need to do just like the thief on the cross did. It just shows us another example of what the Word of God tells us and confirms it by seeing that it can happen that way. In other words, if you know someone who is dying on their deathbed and they were a, 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 you know, a mass murderer and you believed in sanctification or persevering, what's the point in telling them the gospel message? There is no point because they can't be saved in your mind because they don't have enough works. They haven't persevered enough. So you might as well just not even tell them the gospel. But that's not what God's word says. It says that he died for the whole world, all of the world, because he loves every single one of us. So when someone is on their deathbed, I don't care what they've done or what they haven't done. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear it, at least get the option to be saved by faith through, through Jesus Christ. So the whole model is just really jacked up when it comes to thinking about works being mandatory for what God has provided and given to us. Because some people, it excludes some people. And that, that, I think that's where the limited atonement comes in. There's certain people that are excluded from the salvation of Christ. Now, this second area right here that we're moving into that I want to talk a little bit about because righteousness of course, applies to this as well in phase two. And this is where the carnal Christian falls in phase two. This is the believer that's out of fellowship, not necessarily in the plan of God, functioning on our own, per se. This is also where the Christian who is growing in faith goes. This is where the walk goes or the lack of the walk, phase two. Or fruit versus not producing any fruit. All in phase two. Now, you got to ask, how does God's righteousness relate to the Christian walk? Well, first of all, you have to have it to produce any fruit. You've got to have his righteousness to produce, produce fruit. In other words, they have to be approved by God to be worthy of God, to be rewardable. They have to be associated with are attached or you have to be a believer to be to produce fruit that's all I'm saying you have to be qualified to live the Christian way of life is another way to say that um, now remember we're talking about believers who have God's 
perfect righteousness. Now this is, this is in 1 Corinthians 3. And in 1 Corinthians, there were many problems plaguing the local church. They were plaguing the local church. And one of them was carnal, fleshly people out of fellowship. This was a problem in the church. And Paul wants to talk about it. And I mean, we're in phase two. We're talking about righteousness. We're talking about the believer living the Christian way of life. Of course, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to be in here at some point. But let's begin to read 1 Corinthians 3, 1. It says, and I, brethren, now listen, right off the bat, believers in Jesus Christ. Paul speaking to believers. Could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as carnal men, as to infants in Christ. So you see what's going on here. He's saying, I can't speak to you as spiritual men. The word spiritual here refers to just that, the Holy Spirit. Spiritual, the word is pneumatikos. So to be spiritual requires the Holy Spirit. He says, I can't speak to you as spiritual men right now. I can't do it. Because what does he say? But I can speak to you as carnal men. In other words, fleshly. You're, they weren't walking the Christian walk. But they were believers. Because he addresses them as that. So we know that all believers are permanently indwelled and sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment they believe in Jesus Christ. So the indwelling doesn't go away, but what does go away? The filling, the filling of the Holy Spirit. What takes it away is sin. That's what takes it away. That's the issue is sin here. So there's, there's something going on with these men. They're believers. They're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. But the filling of the Holy Spirit, and there's no knowledge rooted there to, to keep them in a, a spiritual status, Paul's trying to tell them. Remember, we're mandated in Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. We're not mandated to be indwelled by the Spirit. Indwelling is always 100% indwelled. That's your seal of approval eternity in heaven. So, so that's one of the reasons Paul calls them carnal. Some translations say, and I like this too, men of flesh. It's a good translation. And that's also why he calls them infants in Christ. Basically an analogy here. He's saying, I can either call you carnal men, and it's describing you as infants in Christ. Another way to say it. So there's another use of this word, pneumatikos, which involves the Holy Spirit, that has to do with teaching. Has to do with teaching. Has to do with how you learn the Word of God. Remember, the Holy Spirit has a part to play in the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what we call it. Which, the truth goes into your ears. That's why we always take care of that at the beginning of class. So we need the Holy Spirit's guidance and the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit actually has a part in the teaching ministry inside your soul. Because he takes the content of the word and makes it spiritual content. Th keep in mind, when an unbeliever comes in here and sits down, they can hear the content, they can understand the content to a certain extent, but it's just knowledge to them. Gnosis, right? The Holy Spirit is the one who has to come into play and make this spiritual information usable for you as a believer. Pneumatikos. That's another way this word is used. But Paul here is just using it and saying spiritual men. But see, it's really the issue is the Holy Spirit. Whether it's in them is the case or not. Whether it comes to teaching, when it comes to living the spiritual way of life, it all goes back to the Holy Spirit in each case. So for Paul to say he couldn't speak to them as spiritual men also meant that there wasn't much or any spiritual growth happening. Just wasn't happening because that process requires the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Here's verse 2. 
I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Makes sense, right? He's speaking to them as a teacher with a new set of believers coming in. You're going to give them milk. You're going to give them doctrines that aren't complex. You're going to give them basic doctrines so they can understand who they are as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's understandable. I, he's saying, I gave you milk and not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. What's the point? You don't want to go over everyone's head if they're uh, not there. They just became a believer. And then he says, Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. So there's a problem. You see the problem? It wasn't a problem at the beginning, but now there's a problem. He's saying you're still fleshly. In other words, you're still without the Spirit. There's still no knowledge of Scripture, at least involving the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. So there's a learning problem. There's a learning problem, and, and Paul is pointing it out. And I think it's an important point because Paul is speaking to a congregation. Paul is speaking to a congregation, just like I'm speaking to you. And there's some people in the congregation that aren't able to move on to the more advanced things. They're good with just accepting the basic and leaving it at the basics. But the problem with that is there's no growth. There's no life that glorifies God because they've lost fellowship most of the time because there's no truth. When you don't advance, you don't have any persistence in the spirit. You can't. It's just like when you do anything, when you get good at something, what do you have to do? You have to do it a lot. And it's the same thing with the spiritual life. You've got to do it a lot if you want to be consistent in fellowship. And that's why he says, Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you're still fleshly. Now, I like Paul's analogies. He's, he's kind of going to the baby analogy. Eventually, a baby starts off with a bottle, and they grow and they advance and then they go to heart solid food right i knew a, i knew a girl in high school never stopped sucking on her thumb i mean you know that's that's kind of common but can you imagine if she was drinking a bottle still never stopped drinking a bottle that would be different but now relate that to spiritual growth if you're still on the bottle as a christian as a believer not advancing just a believer, not knowing what you stand for in Christ. Um, that's where the issue comes in. That's where the problem comes in. Because we have a responsibility as believers in Jesus Christ. We have responsibilities that Scripture mandates us to do and be and become. And it all evolves around your volition. What are you going to do with what you've been given? Either you set it aside or you grow spiritually and leave it what God has given you. And I'm not telling you this as admonishing you or getting on to you. I'm telling you this as look at the great things that you have available. Look at what God has given us. We've got to take advantage of these things. I hate to see a new believer that just, you know, leaves these things as milk and doesn't want to accept the more advanced doctrines because not only are they depriving themselves, you know, eventually a baby doesn't get enough nutrients. They don't get the things that they need from the milk. They need solid food to sustain the body in growth. And it's no different with us as believers in Jesus Christ. We need solid food, and we have to start eating steak. I know some of you are vegetarians. Some of you that like steak are saying, yes, when are we getting to the steak? Well, I ask that sometimes too. But we, we, God gives us the good stuff. He gives us the solid food. He does. And so don't worry about if you're a, vegeta a vegetarian, God is going to give you a lot of vegetables, and they're going to be very complex. <laughs> That I know for a fact. 
Um, so, but at this point in their life, they weren't there, is all I'm saying. They weren't, they weren't able to receive it, the more advanced things. So, um, and here we go. Verse 3 continued, For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? So you see what's happening uh, between them. This is the result of carnal believers in the congregation. This is what happens. Carnality creates jealousy. It creates strife. It creates divisions. It creates things that get in the way of a free-flowing natural relationship. Jealousy and strife. This is a carnality problem. See, sometimes these things sneak up on us. Well, I've been growing spiritually. I'm doing these things. I'm doing. But if you're jealous, that's a sin. That means we're in carnality and that is causing divisions. Jealousy here means negative feelings towards someone because of who they are, maybe because of who they associate with, maybe who they're related to, maybe what they have or what they don't have, or because of many, many other things. You could probably fill in the blank. Um, and these things become very visible, very visible in the church to the person that they are directed to. They become very visible. You may not mean for them to be. You may be trying to keep these things in, but they become very visible because they start to cause divisiveness. And there's a little ripple in the water there. The very subtle effects of jealousy. So, which is why the word strife here is mentioned. And by the way, both jealousy and strife are sins. This is while we're in the church. This is while we're growing spiritually. This is while we're taking in spiritual food or maybe not taking in spiritual food. I think we can all be susceptible to jealousy. I'm going to apply it to us. Uh, these things come out in different ways, but I think you get the point. People usually begin to get treated differently than others when jealousy comes out. Um, and, and that's displeasing to God. And things we should actually confess so you don't come to a standstill in your spiritual growth. We got to identify these things. We have to identify these things and squash them like bugs. Because they'll slow you down in your growth, and we got to have a, free, a, a freeness of flowing in relationships within the congregation. I'm not saying everybody has to be your best buddy. I'm just saying there can't be any of these hidden things that are causing any kind of hang-ups between you and your relationships with people. They're growing just like you are. They're on the same page just like you are. They want the same things as you. You're all one in Christ. So the word for strife, strife here doesn't mean fistfights. It means being contentious or just having a difference based on that jealousy. Now, Paul then asks, are you not walking like mere men? Remember he said that or he says it right here. Are you not walking like mere men? Which is basically saying they're walking the spiritual walk out of fellowship. In carnality. So we actually got through where I wanted to get through, but uh, you didn't think I'd hit you with a left hook at the very end of the lesson, did you? That's just the Word of God. I, I got to teach it how it comes out, how it unfolds, and that's what came out. I got hit too. I always see, I just get hit in, the office, in my office. You get hit in the congregation, in the pew. It's just a little bit different, but it's the same thing. God always hits us between the eyes. 
But it's a good thing, right? Because now we can identify, we can look at it, we can observe, we can change, and our thinking changes, and then we can move forward and look back on this and say, you know what? I'm moving on to the steaks or whatever you eat. <laughs> Baked potato, those are filling and they're good. So um, with that being said, let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Father, we're thankful for your word, thankful for everything that you do for us. We don't always uh, know the direction, know the truths, but your, your word and your ways have a tendency to pull those out for us when we need them and how we need them. And we thank you so much for Jesus Christ um, because we know that sin is not the issue of anyone on this earth. What is the issue is what they think about Jesus Christ. Your word tells us that all we need to do is to believe in Jesus Christ and we will be saved. That's the issue between everyone here and everyone on this earth. It's not about what you can do or can't do. It's about belief. We thank you so much for the gift and the sufficiency of Christ on the cross. And we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.